Uh, okay, you ready? I give you a, a, a I'll speak slowly and give you a, an introduction while the participant count is uh, going up. So um, it's my great pleasure today to welcome uh, Kirsten Fagan from the Joint Genome Institute to speak to us about computing at the JGI. Um, some of you may know Kirsten started at Berkeley Lab as a petascale postdoc way back in 2009 or 2010, somewhere around there. Um, Kirsten was one of my first office mates way back when at NERSC. And uh, at that point she was working on um, AMR and related uh, problems, which um, was related to her PhD work, which was in a similar area. Um, then in 2016, she moved over to support, no, earlier than that, she moved over to support the JGI user base. And then in 2016, she moved over full time to work at the JGI as the chief informatics officer. And so she's responsible for deploying and executing um, the strategy for computing and data analysis of the GGI. And that's what she's going to talk to us about today. So welcome, Kirsten, and over to you. Thanks, Nick. It also looks like no one uses their video, so I'm not going to use mine. <laughs> and if you have questions, oh, there's my heat. Hey, this is so weird. Zoom talks are weird. <laughs> <laughs> There's Brian. Oh, this is nice. It's like a little nurse reunion. <laughs> Put our video on so you can see our reactions in real time. If you would like. Oh, yeah. You know, it's hard to tell when people are bored otherwise, you know? And uh, how can yeah. we be bored? <laughs> I, you know, this is a good question. Oh, and there's Rob. All right. This is, this is quite the party. Um, this would be way more fun if we were in person, don't you think? But then we'd all have to be on the hill. And uh, yeah, commuting's unfun. So I, I know that I sent an abstract indicating that maybe I'd have a, a good focus on, on infrastructure and I will talk about that, but I'm also gonna talk a little bit about this whole idea of being in an Office of Science Public Reusable Research data resource, because maybe you've heard about these in the context of FAIR data, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. And this is the data seminar, so I thought some of that would be relevant as well. And of course, I don't know and can't see everyone who's on this call, but these are kind of the obligatory introductory slides for those who, those who have never heard of JGI before. We would be in the building that sits on the old Bevatron site, pretty close to building 59 that opened. We've actually spent less time in that building than we have in shelter in place, which I guess gets less interesting the longer we kind of do this working remotely thing. Um, it also houses the National Microbiome Data Collaborative and KBase. So JGI is a user facility just like NERSC and ESNet and ALS. Um, we provide sequencing capabilities to those who are trying to do weird things like sequence and understand plants and fungi and metagenomes. Um, yeah, we get about $80 million a year and there are about 300 staff that work at JGI, most of whom are remote right now. This is the history of the JGI. I think it's pretty cool that it started out of the Human Genome Project. If you listen to people now, they're like, it shouldn't have been called the human genome. It was just a human genome. It's an example of a human genome. Um, but I think most people kind of forget that the DOE was actually pretty instrumental in getting the Human Genome Project kicked off. And this was a big collaborative effort across uh, actually a bunch of different national labs, which is where the joint comes from and the Joint Genome Institute's name. And then JGI transitioned into a production sequencing facility. Then, you know, next gen sequencing came along and there was another transition. And now JGI is really focused on not just producing a lot of sequence data, but also figuring out how to integrate sequence data with other types of instrument data, other types of omics data. Um, yeah. So JGI offers sequencing in all of these different areas, um, as well as thinking about how to synthesize different DNA constructs. If you've heard about CRISPR, this is kind of related to that, and also looking at metabolomics analysis. So if you take a sample from the soil, you might want to look at the genome, the blueprint of what's there, the transcriptome, what genes were turned on, and then also the metabolome of what was being produced in the soil um, when you took the sample. 
Yeah, so I think environmental genomics is really cool. And if you've heard a little bit about this concept of the bioeconomy, and if you're thinking a little bit about, I don't know, things like climate change, which I feel like should be on everyone's mind. I feel like this is a safe audience for this, but the world's getting hotter, things are on fire. We have no water in California. I'm not sure what we're all still doing here, except that it's an awesome place to live. Um, but a lot of the work that's going on in synthesis and the creation of biofuels is really to enable replacement products for things that typically have come from fossil fuels. And so I think that's pretty cool. And you can check out this slide later if you want to. Uh, JGI has lots of primary users. So these are all the people around the world that collect samples, extract DNA and RNA, or send the samples to us for metabolomics analysis. And so there are a couple thousand of those users, but we also have tens of thousands of what we call data users that are interacting with JGI through things that look like science gateways. So we have a lot of people that are leveraging JGI for analysis and data generation and um, you know, scientific understanding. So the reason I'm talking about computing and informatics in this talk is because these are foundational activities uh, uh, across JGI. So we have uh, infrastructure and systems that support everything from how we engage with our users, which is kind of this proposal management and project specification to bringing in their samples and doing the sequencing and analysis to then all of the sequence data publication that comes out through those science gateways. And so underlying all of this is really uh, computing and informatics infrastructure. Most of DHI's infrastructure is at NERSC and has been at NERSC since about 2010 uh, when that partnership formed. Um, I thought you might be interested in seeing how JGI's computing usage at NERSC has evolved over time. Um, excuse me. So, you know, this is really just the usage of, uh, of CORI, of the CORI resource by JGI, which has increased over the last couple of years because JGI used to have its own cluster called Mental, which some of you might remember. And then we moved to entirely using Cori in 2019. Um, and so the usage has really ramped up and I actually did not update this in the last month, but I'm sure that's higher because we've actually almost hit and exceeded our current allocation of 50 million nurse hours on M342. And Cori Gene Pool, for those who don't know this, is a cabinet of Cori that's dedicated to JGI's use. Why would we have a cabinet dedicated to JGI? Because it's a user facility and we do a spectrum of work that ranges from being able to QC and process data all the way up to data analysis that requires uh, supercomputers. And Cori Gene Pool will retire in 2022. So one of the things that we've been thinking about recently is how do we replace this capacity? We're going to have an allocation from BER on NERSC's Perlmutter system. Um, but when Cori goes away, we'll no longer have that dedicated cabinet. Um, we also have a storage footprint at NERSC. We have the DNA file system, the community file system. Um, this is just a snapshot of how much we use. JGI is pretty storage intensive because we've got all of the instrument data that comes into NERSC. And then there's a bunch of processing that happens and all those files get transferred between different groups for different steps in the analysis process before making their way to the users. Um, and we've looked at different ways to sort of optimize the storage dependent on the use case. And we had an existing file system called Project B, which is currently being migrated into CFS. Um, and then that'll be shut down. But JGI will still have probably about a seven-ish petabyte footprint within NERSC just for supporting kind of our regular operations. JGI also has a ton of web services. And this is just something that I like to remind people of, that computing isn't just sort of the high performance computing that happens on the Cori system. We also have a lot of services that enable the interaction with our users, like the science gateways, but we've got a bunch of small services that also handle automation and workflow execution and data management and our laboratory information management system. And so all of these things kind of combined really support the ability of JGI to function and operate. And uh, over the past couple of years, uh, our systems infrastructure team has expanded our web services infrastructure footprint. 
We've got SVMs in lab IT and um, we've got virtual machine infrastructure that's going into IGB as well. We've also stood up some servers within IGB to serve as kind of a local cache for the instrument data so that if NERSC is unavailable, we can still have uh, the sequencers running, producing data. And then when NERSC is available again, it transfers data over. Um, and so we've been looking at how to balance all of the different uh, resources that are available within the Berkeley Lab Complex to kind of keep JGI operating. And we did an exercise with the JGI staff where we gave the prompt of, I wish our compute infrastructure would be, you know, and they, they would like support of microservices, which I think you can get from SPIN in the VM infrastructure. They, they like some ease to be able to deploy applications and services. And then there, was a, there were many, many, many comments around stability. And so the reason I included this slide is because we've got kind of um, a tension within JGI where we do have a subset of staff that are doing research and development oriented work. They're running large jobs or running things at scale, but we're also a user facility that has to produce products for our users. And we have metrics and things that BER, DOE, sorry, the Office of Biological and Environmental Research tracks. So that's, you know, the equivalent of Oscar um, that funds NERSC and ESNet. Um, and so this, this stability issue comes up time and time again, because we have data that's being produced consistently every day as people do experiments and people need a reliable resource for being able to process that data. And the other thing that is kind of an interesting quirk when it comes to our workflows and pipelines is that they're incredibly dynamic. So we also need an environment where people can be developing and incorporating the latest tools for the analysis of these data. And um, that, that again, kind of drives the need for infrastructure that looks a little bit different um, than what you would find on Cori. So this is just some fun feedback we get from JGSF. Um, um, yeah. If you were to ask those people, though, how much stability would they trade off for the access to the latest tools, given that it's impossible to be completely stable and be completely cutting edge at the same time, what would they say? Uh, I would, I don't know, some, some of those folks are probably on this call and I probably shouldn't put word in their mouth, but uh, I think that what I would, what I would get is just, yes, we would like all the things and Mendel was really stable. So why can't we have that again? And so I think what's needed for, to support JGI, and I'll get to this in a second, is a spectrum of computing resources where like, you know, to have the most efficient and high performance algorithms and where you're processing lots of data that's something that runs at NERSC. Whereas if you're doing more development and more experimentation, that might be something that you're doing in the cloud or on a mid-range computing resource. And so the, the trade-offs, you know, they exist, but also the mode of operation that people are in when they're doing their work is different um, when they're using those different resources. And I think it's, I think it's a good thing to have uh, targeted resources depending on what a staff member is trying to do. Um, so the other thing that I like to, to call out is that Berkeley Labs on a major fault line. This is where we would all be if we were in building 59 right now. I don't really need to tell you guys this, but um, most samples generated uh, used to generate data at JGI are unique and irreplaceable. So we've gotten some pushback about not just having all of our data sit at Berkeley Lab on a fault line. A lot of it is in HPSS. We have about 14 petabytes there. Um, also, California has earthquakes and fires, like we were talking about earlier, and public safety power shutdowns. And so there's some issues with like completely relying on Berkeley Lab for infrastructure if you're getting some pressure from your user community and some pressure from your funders to be resilient and to be highly available. And we can all discuss what it means to be highly available. That's a pretty hard, hard thing to do. But um, this has caused JGI to think about distributed data and analysis to maintain a high level of scientific productivity. And, you know, like everyone else, we're calling this our resilience strategy. Um, our current infrastructure looks something like this. Over the past couple of years, we've moved some hardware to lab IT from NERSC. Um, we've moved data, the irreplaceable uh, raw sequence data to Oak Ridge and to their tape archive. We also have storage through Laurentium Scratch. We have a bunch of storage that sits at NERSC. We have a lot of our web services sitting within NERSC and Lab IT as well. 
And um, I just like to show this picture because JGI in a lot of ways is already distributed and this is just going to get um, more extreme as we move forward. So this is, this is a slide that actually is somewhat inspired by conversations with Nick. Um, if you think about computing along one axis and the scale of data on another, when you have large amounts of data, you might still have small amounts of computing um, that you need to do. We have uh, you know, some pipelines where we're gonna be processing terabytes and terabytes of data, but the algorithms themselves that people are comfortable using only use a handful of cores. And then we have some algorithms that, you know, I'll, I'll mention later like Meta Hitmer that can use a large number of uh, nodes and can make good use of a supercomputer and are also ingesting a lot of data. So that kind of sits up here in this like ideal area for running things on uh, in a supercomputing environment. And then we have this more, this need for an interactive resource where people are doing prototyping, exploratory analysis, small production work. And that's really kind of the space where we need to problem solve right now. And right now we have a procurement for JGI that's focused on meeting the needs in this green area. We're also using the cloud for a small amount of analysis and, um, and production work for the, the metagenome program as well as the plant program. Some of the constraints that we have, this might be an interesting slide, it might not be, but we were trying to break down and look at rough estimates of the cost to run on these different resources. Um, when we were looking for a place to put some of this mid-range computing, you know, um, we were looking everywhere. It turns out we actually don't have a huge amount of space on the hill or a huge amount of infrastructure where we can actually put computing and data storage. And uh, we were looking at building out IGB and saying, hey, we've got a data center there. Can we do something to actually make that useful? And it turns out that was prohibitively expensive once we engaged facilities on what that would cost. Um, and we're looking for space to put about 100, 200 uh, compute nodes, about two petabytes of storage. And then we also need space for our, our web services. And so I just like to lay out the costs um, roughly for people to see and then did a comparison of different possible options across uh, 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 you know, the lab and EMSL and the cloud. Um, so the, the cloud computing option is really, it's kind of an interesting one because um, if we were able to have persistent storage of the data um, and we could probably run a lot of JGI analyses there, but we have this huge archival data footprint that we need to negotiate and then one of the deal breakers there is actually our portal infrastructure, as well as the cost and the time of getting the staff ready to move all of their workflows into the cloud. Um, but you could imagine once the organization is actually ready to do that, that this could become an attractive option for having this kind of interactive exploratory resource. And then when you want to run things at scale or you want to run on a huge amount of data, we would do that at NERSC. But until we figure out and problem solve the infrastructure for our portals, we're a little cost constrained. Like we need to make strategic investments to make sure our web services and science gateways keep running. And in parallel with that, figure out how to keep our computing going. And um, so we just can't do everything at the same time. But maybe in subsequent years, our next investment won't be for mid-range computing that sits within Berkeley Lab, but it could be in moving everything to the cloud. I, I'm not 100% sure, and I'd be happy to follow up on that later. Um, and so uh, we've allocated or spent about $150,000 on AWS in the past year, and that's primarily been for running the metagenome um, analysis, well, assembly pipelines. So distributed computing is hard. This is one of the things that uh, we've been talking about a lot as an organization is how ready are we to actually move JGI's workflow between different resources. And one slide that I meant to include that I didn't when we were talking to the staff about requirements is I've asked and I've surveyed JGI staff every year about where they'd like to run their computing. Um, and I've given them the whole spectrum of, op of options from nurse to lab IT to the cloud. And year over year, people are selecting NERSC um, because it's what they're comfortable with. And even though it doesn't provide that stability that they're looking for, um, to Nick's earlier point, they know how to run there. They know what it looks like to run there. Moving to another location requires learning some new things, getting new 
passwords and accounts and figuring out how to move data. So there's a huge uh, cost to switching between different platforms and different resources. And that that's, you know, people generally don't want to think about that um, at the JGI. They would like to be producing and exploring and understanding their scientific data. And so, uh, and it's a lot of work to deal with portability and uh, each kind of workflow and there are hundreds of them at JGI requires a little bit of work and tweaking to make it, make it run elsewhere. So uh, JGI's approach for this has been to look at software infrastructure to aid in the execution of distributed jobs. So we have the um, uh, JAWS system, which is a centralized workflow system that's built on top of the Cromwell Workflow Manager, which is a uh, workflow manager out of the Broad Institute, works well with bioinformatics pipelines. There's something called Whittles, the workflow description language, which is um, really similar to the common workflow language or CWLs. Cromwell can adjust both, but Whittles are a little uh, easier to use. And then we've been standing up services across the different infrastructure that we have access to, to uh, basically allow a user to submit a job to this centralized workflow service and have that job get sent elsewhere. So right now, uh, JAWS is working at Lab IT and at NERSC, and we are testing with EMSL and running some benchmarks. So the idea here is that we would actually simplify things for users potentially if they have a whittle, if they have their workflows containerized and they're willing to work with us on how to do the data management, identify like where the, the data is that they need to move, that data movement's happening through Globus right now, then we can actually execute on the distributed resources for them. Um, but even this, we're having some difficulty with adoption, like spending the time to actually write a whittle, to containerize your workflows, um, to learn something new is uh, something that really needs to be incentivized if it's gonna work. Uh, but our hope is that we can provide this common interface for staff to be able to access resources. And uh, one of the other things we're thinking about is how much more data we're going to be dealing with over the, you know, we already have a lot of data and we're just producing more. The community is producing more. There's not really been a slowdown, say in the production of metagenomics data, and what people are also interested in are the metatranscriptomes, metabolomes, metaproteomes, and all of the ohms <laughs> from a different environment for understanding what's happening in these microbial communities, which is something we probably all want, right? Everyone here has probably heard about microbiomes because you have one in your gut. You, you know, this is more fun when we're in person, but I'll just say that like, if you think about it, how much bacteria do you have in your body? About five to seven pounds of bacteria in the average person. That's a lot of little creatures running around on your insides, like helping to keep you healthy and safe. And mostly I'm just saying that to see if you all are still paying attention because I know Zoom talks are hard and your email and everything is right there and very exciting. But that's kind of crazy to think about. And if you really want to aggregate all of that information about that five to seven pounds of bacteria just in your own little microbiome, that's a lot of data to try and analyze. It's a lot of data to try and reason about. and what we're able to do right now is just a fraction of what we'd like to be able to do when you wanna bring all of those different types of measurements together. Um, and so how, how can we actually remove these barriers to data access and analysis at larger scales? And that seems like something where we should be leveraging our large scale computing facilities. And so what I think is really cool is the fact that Meta Hitmer and Rob is on the call. I'm not sure anyone else from the Exabiome project is on the call, but this is really awesome and really exciting. So I don't know, the Meta Hitmer project started, I think back in 2014. So think about that. It's like been like seven years that this project has been underway. And now it's being used for scientific results that couldn't have been done any other way. So you have these huge metagenomic data sets that are coming into JGI. And typically what people would do is they'd try to break those apart into subsamples and then you know, assemble each of those subsamples separately. And what happens when you do that is you actually lose out on some of the like lower signal in that sample and you don't pick it up. But when you combine all of the samples together, you're able to pick up 
the signal of sort of lower abundant organisms that might be really important in understanding particular dynamics, you know, in a subtropical soil or after there's been a burn. And so it's pretty exciting that now um, JGI and CRD have put together a tool that can be used to actually help all of these users. I guess this guy is at Berkeley Lab, but all of these users in the community assemble data sets and analyze data and interrogate them. And they couldn't have been able to do this otherwise. But I'll tell you back in 2014, people were real skeptical about the idea of using a supercomputer based method for doing metagenome assembly, because there's a huge focus in this community on having tools that people can run on their laptops. But the size and scale of the data, like I showed in that last slide, really demand these kinds of tools and really demand this kind of development. And there are other things that the Exabiome project is working on, like HIPMCL for looking at clustering, some different types of deep learning methods. And it, it's all really going to drive kind of a discovery in a different way because you can't escape the fact that these samples are huge. This is so much bigger than your genome or my genome. Um, you know, I guess it might be comparable if we took our gut microbiomes and started looking at them, but it's kind of crazy when you start to look at soils. And there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in different environments when you want to think about how microbes and all these unseen organisms are really, you know, helping to drive the health of the planet. And so I think this is exciting just because I've watched it for the last seven years and it's awesome that they're actually getting results. And then there was this, the largest ever metagenome assembly. That, that Words like that sound really cool, um, but for the same reasons, like the science coming out of this is really exciting. Um, and so they actually were able to take this data set and assemble it on Summit and it had to be Summit. It couldn't be Corig because they needed that much memory per node to be able to do the assembly. If you have questions about that, ping Rob. Um, and then, you know, they take the output from the combined assemblies and they're able to do bins to really understand what organisms are present in that sample. And so that was an eight terabyte run or terabase sample, sorry. I still confuse that. I still say byte instead of base, but it's fine. Anyway, and then there's this 25 terabase sample, which would be really awesome to be able to assemble because it's a huge time series data set looking at what microbial communities have looked like in this particular environment over 20 years. And so that'll be really exciting to be able to see like how, you know, those communities have evolved in that environment. And it's not possible if we don't use supercomputers. And so I guess this is my way of saying like, yes, we do a lot of processing. We do a lot of small scale stuff, but it drives our ability to also pull that data in and do these large scale analyses, which is pretty exciting. Um, and now I just want to comment a little bit on this whole FAIR data, SC pure data resource thing. Um, these are so, just a snapshot of statistics and a summary slide, you know, that of JGI as one of these SC pure data resources. We have a large repository. We've supported a lot of publications and data users and primary users. We support a huge number of downloads and a lot of analysis and access through our science gateways. And you know, what is JGI doing to make our data fairer? Um, I don't know, fair is kind of an interesting topic. It sounds really nice, right? We want everything to be fair. I think that really resonates with humans is think when things are fair. So that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And this, I guess, definition of fair data has been around for a few years. It came out of Europe. And it's really gaining momentum. And the idea behind it, in case you haven't heard this yet, is that we're trying to make data accessible to machines, not just humans, but to machines. And so when you take a step back and you think about what would it mean for a robot to access your data, that's really what you need to be able to make your data fair. You can't have any sort of semantic information buried in identifiers. You can't like assume that a human's gonna be looking at it and understand the structure. You have to have a well-defined structure, well-defined set of identifiers such that you could send in um, a bot and they could find all of the data in your repository. That's kind of how I think about it. And that they could do that repeatedly. Like the system's not going to change over time unless you publish and let the world know what those changes are. So it's a little bit weird, um, but it's something we have to think about because uh, we are producing a lot of data 
uh, JGA, like I said already. And these data are in demand. People want to download them. They want to reuse them. And we've got this large data repository that lives at NERSC, and we have to manage that. We have to make it available. And so in the past year, um, I'm talking about this because I think this is a really cool project. <laughs> it took a lot of time. It actually wasn't just the past year. It was a couple of years where we worked on making our data more findable and accessible in the community. So our flagship portals, Mycocosm, uh, Phycocosm now for algae, Mycocosm is for fungi, Phytosome is for plants, IMG is for microbes and metagenomes, have done an amazing job serving their respective communities. And people heavily use those tools to do analysis of the, their respective organism of interest. But I think we didn't do as good a job developing a data portal type resource where people could come and search across all of those different resources to find data. In fact, because we were a user facility, most of what we set up was tied to specific projects. So we were just serving the individual primary PIs that were sending us a sample and we were providing that data back to them. And there's been a growing need for people to be able to pull in large data sets. Like some of the recent publications by JGI users are leveraging tens of thousands of data sets. And if we really want people to kind of reproduce those studies or maybe build upon those studies, we need to make all of that data as accessible as possible. So we have these use cases kind of driving the need for new infrastructure and rethinking the way we're doing infrastructure. And, you know, we, we have this fundamental belief that sharing data is going to make for better science. It should be the case that people could get all of the data to reproduce an experiment. We can argue about whether or not people ever will reproduce an experiment, but the fundamental issue is like they need to be able to access the data. And we need to provide sort of clear, immutable identifiers so that people can come back and find it again and again. Uh, we decided in 2019 to overhaul our major data access points. We decided to actually create and build uh, an API and a new data portal and a new search interface. We engaged our users directly and we simplified access to JGI's generated public data. And I think it's really important when you're building a user facing system to actually engage the users in that process. This is a big complex workflow to just say, you know, we iterated through this process over the last year and a half. Um, we did a ton of user research. We talked with, I don't know, like 50 different JGI users at different points and had them test different functionality in the system. Um, this is a snapshot showing kind of the old uh, genome portal where everything's organized by project. And in the new data portal, everything is now or organized by organism. And so if you're somebody that's not familiar with JGI, if you're not familiar with the fact that we organize things by projects because PIs are sending us samples, you know, when you come to this interface and you just are interested in say E. coli, you know, it's not gonna be clear to you necessarily how to get that. And that was what we heard from the users when we, when we did interviews. And so we restructured our data portal to be focused on the types of things people actually wanted to search for. Um, and this was actually a huge metadata harmonization problem. Maybe you all have heard this phrase, maybe you haven't, but metadata harmonization is certainly something that sounds cool right now, right? And that means kind of taking your metadata and making it sort of uh, aligned to different standards and getting everyone to agree that if there's a standard, all of their metadata will adhere to it. And it's a huge, huge um, pain in the ass. I know this is being recorded, but anyway. Uh, and it, why? Because it's not fun to sit and do bookkeeping. It's not fun to think about whether or not this ID that you've used is the same ID in the standard, and therefore you need to change all of the values to actually match what the set, like what the controlled vocabulary is, and like are you using ontologies properly? And it's just it's not fun. But when you have a motivating use case like providing a new access point to JGI's data resources, it actually catalyzed an effort within the organization to align on a few, not a lot of common metadata fields, but a handful of metadata fields that power that organism driven search, which was a huge effort and pretty awesome that we pulled it off. And this clean metadata also lets us have a cleaner architecture. So we're linking everything through a system called JAMA, which we've talked about at NERSC before, but for those who haven't heard of it, this is JGI's data management system. It, ha it tracks all of the work that's been done within the organization. And it really became 
um, a very powerful resource when we were kind of reframing how we make data available to the users. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that, but it, it can be a place to kind of house all of this different information that has meaning to the users, but is not necessarily how we structure and organize a project internally. And so you guys, if you're feeling bored someday and really want to go find your favorite microbe or find your favorite plants on the JGI data portal, it's data. Yeah, anyway, the URL is here. It's got a nicer download page. And one of the things that we've also been able to do is make it clear when data is on tape or when data is on disk and when things might take a while. We've done a lot of work actually um, with our data management system, and by we, I mean Chris Beecroft, to make sure that we don't actually abuse the HPSS system at NERSC, which um, actually led to a couple of fun projects. Um, but yeah, it's pretty nice. People can download either through the browser or through the API, and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback. And so this is part of the F and A in FAIR, making data findable and accessible. And then we wanted to think a bit about how JGI data are being reused. And I think um, for those of us in science, we like to understand that the work that we've done actually has an impact. We'd like to understand how people have reused or cited the, the publications that we've put out there. And this becomes a much harder problem or trickier problem when you have lots of different identifiers. And for JGI, they can either get data from JGI or they can get it from the, the sequence read archive run by the National Institute of Health. So that's like the main sequence data repository and everyone can go there and get our data. And there are some identifiers associated with it, but they might not cite JGI when they do that. Um, and so we had kind of this big problem of trying to understand really what is the impact and what has been the impact of JGI data beyond the publications that our primary users put out. And so anyway, the, this is the problem statement. Are there publications that utilize our data products but don't cite us? Yes. Um, why is it challenging? Because there's, there are tons of identifiers. And so we took metadata from JAMO and we worked with a, a group called Names for Life to actually take all of those identifiers and identify publications that cite JGI identifiers that weren't actually cataloged in our resource. And so um, we actually looked at these results. We got several hundred publications back with a 98% validity rate. 69% of those were not already publications we were aware of. And then 81%, like they have this different tiering of publications based on, you know, uh, the proximity to having submitted a proposal, working with one of those groups. Anyway, so we identified a lot of new papers and they actually did use JGI data and it was a lot of work. And um, there are some missing parts though beyond publications and that there are also patents and grants and other, uh, you know, things that happen with JGI data that we're not aware of. So in this whole bioeconomy space, like how much JGI data might be going into a, a new patent? I don't know, is there a way to capture this? So if you combine the names for life work that we did um, with this tool called Dimensions out of all metrics, then you can actually find, and this gets kind of messy, but basically you can identify patents, grants, and other publications that didn't come up in the names for life search since that's just looking at open access journals. And the takeaway message is that we were able to identify an additional several, you know, more than a thousand uh, additional publications. And some of them were in high impact journals. Um, we can debate that later. Uh, 45 different research areas, tons of countries, lots of different institutions. And I think this kind of data is really exciting and really interesting when you want to think about the impact of your organization. And I think sometimes you get a little too I don't know, or I will get a little too myopic and a little too focused on like what JGI is doing day to day. And I think it's kind of cool to actually be able to extrapolate beyond that. But this was only possible because we actually have our metadata managed in a centralized system. And because we had this collaboration to identify these publications in the open source literature, and then there are existing tools like Dimensions where you can pay for a license and get all of this information back. But with a single JAMO record, we were able to identify an additional 82 publications with a ton of citations. And so 
this gives JGI like a new kind of data resource that we can use to kind of look through and understand how people are using our data. It lets us potentially identify new data users to provide input on what data resources are of value to them. And I, I don't know, it's just been a lot of fun. So anyway, uh, and why does this matter? Because in the past two weeks, we have had users download 30,000, 80,000, and 120,000 files from our system at a time. That's a lot. And we'd love to understand what they're doing with them. We'd love to understand how to prioritize resourcing uh, effort to make these data sets easy to get. When somebody puts in a request for 120,000 files, that's pretty disruptive to the people who just want to restore 10 and download them. Um, and so how do we figure out who to prioritize? When do we draw the line and say, hey, we'd like to understand what you're doing with the data before you access all of JGI's, I don't know, historical data records. Um, and so this is going to become a growing issue because we're only seeing these types of requests increase. And I've been pretty happy that we've had the infrastructure in place to help support it. So it's kind of a balance in wanting to open up the floodgates, but then making sure you've got good infrastructure in place when people do come and want to download the data. So in summary, uh, we are moving towards this resilient and stable uh, infrastructure in an ideal world. I, it's going to be pretty hard to get there, but that's our goal. And so we've moved to this distributed computing model, which presents a lot of challenges for staff and for management, for social engineering, and for having the right software infrastructure to support it. Um, you might hear this term of, uh, you know, this Office of Science Public Reusable Research Data Resource floating around. That just means that that organization is a steward of unique data and analysis products, and we're responsible for making sure those don't disappear from public record. Um, FAIR is only going to increase in popularity, I think, over the next couple of years. There's all this like FAIR data for artificial intelligence and machine learning that you're going to hear about too. And I do believe that if you don't have kind of this corpus of usable scientific data, it's going to be really hard for us to leverage the methods that are being developed right now. And I think there are people here that are much better versed in this than me. All I'm trying to do is make sure the data exists so that you can use it. Um, so that, and this was a huge investment. It introduced a new process for software engineering at JGI2, which I didn't really touch on. Um, but it, and it's also been a tight coupling with our user community with getting feedback and making sure that we were building and investing in a system that worked for them, which, you know, is kind of awesome as a user facility that we're able to do that and invest the energy and time and money in that. Um, reusability is uh, I think an excellent goal and it's something that we want to understand and we want to facilitate reusability of the data, but we also want to understand what people are doing with it. Um, and so we've been doing a lot of work in these different areas to kind of make this possible. And then I just made a janky little thank you slide and I'll stop and we can, we can chat more.